So before I move on to a discussion of finite element principles as it relates to Moose, um, does anybody have any questions? Okay. So to introduce um, the idea of finding coefficients to a function, which is interpolating um, a set of points and trying to turn it into a function, um, you're looking for coefficients to a function that has that form. So where a, b, and c are your coefficients and your one x and x squared are the basis functions of your interpolated function. Um, so we want to, in this case, we want to find a, b, and c where c, i are the coefficients that you have to solve for and x to the i is the, uh, the basis function set. So fx is considered unique and interpolary if d plus one is the same as the number of points you need to fit. And so all we're doing in Moose is we need to solve a linear system um, or what we're doing in this case is solve a linear system to find the coefficients. In Moose's case, your basis function set is we have a set of points, 1, 4, 3, 1, and 4, 2. Uh, substitute that data into a, a, a linear system, and then we can solve for a, b, and c. And so we have these coefficients, and then now we have our, our, our final solution function. So the important thing to note here is the solution is the function, not the coefficients themselves. Um, the coefficients were given, but of course we wanted it to be defined anywhere in between, so that's an interpolation. Um, so we can evaluate it at a particular point in space. Um, so finite elements is that you're numerically approximating a solution to PDEs. So we're, we're doing what we just did, but we're doing it with a set here. So the Galerkin finite element method is specific um, in that it's, it's, it's different from finite difference in finite volume because it finds a piecewise continuous function that's an approximate solution. So you are uh, uh, adding up these shape functions, evaluating the point, multiplying by your, your coefficients, and then the, uh, it has a much longer uh, mathematical history. So the, uh, like we were talking about earlier, the, the, the idea of a weak form or a variational statement or a weighted residual, um, you'll, you'll find it in the literature under all these names. Um, so the, the weak form, um, like, I, like, I did before, like I said before, the weak form involves writing down the paper form of the PDE method. Your test function is the same as your basis function that you're using to interpolate. Um, then you're integrating the whole equation over your domain and then integrating by parts to get out your, your boundary condition terms and your kernel terms um, to use Moose language. So again, um, the benefit of, of, of it's, it's when you're interpolating, it's valued over the whole, all, the whole domain, um, but it's, you're, you're trying to localize it to be valid in each individual um, mesh location or cell location. Uh, so let's see. Again, this is, this is similar to what we were saying before. Um, the, 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 for example, with the, uh, the um, Diffusion style equation. Again, we're, we are we are integrating. We are multiplying by basis function, integrating, and then separating it out to find the terms that are relevant to us. Um, so we've already gone through this example a couple times. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and skip through that. Um, but then again, this is we have a strong form of our diffusion, and then a, 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 an advection term. Um, so we arrange to get zero. We multiply through by our test function. We integrate. And we apply our divergence theorem. So after we get this, we have our kernels, our boundary conditions. I didn't realize I put this much quite this much about this in these slides. So a kernel, a kernel is just is moose for a piece of physics. Um, so a, your diffusion in your in your in your equation will be a kernel, or your advection term will be a kernel, or your reaction, like so there's a reaction term, that'll also be a kernel. So anything that's That's a good clarification. So, right. So, as David was saying, so a kernel is a volumetric term in this equation. So a lot of people get it wrong when they're ask, asking questions about it. Okay. So, does anybody have any questions about any of that before I move on? 
So we're about to get into talking about shape functions that we're interpolating against um, as opposed to the, the general method. Okay. So for our, um, so the weak form is what you need to add physics. Um, but then in software, the work is a, a little bit, uh, is a, a, a 2D form of the, the linear Lagrange uh, basis function that I was talking about earlier. So it's zero at the, at the points around it and one at the point that you're interested in, um, and then linear in between. And so they're also called hat functions because of their shape. But these, we need to get this, we need to get our equation in a form that we can, we can make by u. And so u is our, sol our solution, uh, is made up of a sum of uj, our coefficients, and vj, our, uh, our uh, basis functions. So the, uh, the gradient can be expanded in a similar way. Um, so um, if, we, if we expand this out, our coefficients, because they are constant, or they pull out of the gradient, so we have a... So like I mentioned, the, in the Glur confined element method, the same basis functions are used for both the trial functions and the test functions. The trial functions that make up your, your, um, your uh, interpolation and the test functions that you multiply your strong form by in order to get a, a residual form. So substituting all this back into the weak form that we generated earlier, uh, then we have our... Um, Moose code. Okay. So typical families um, for this, and the, those that you'll find in Moose, are Lagrange, Hermite, hierarchic monomial, and um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to pronounce this word. Clo, touche. <sighs> Please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so Moose has support for all of these. Um, most of the time, when you're getting started, directly respond to the value of the functions of the nodes. Um, which is why, um, why we're, we're using them as the default. And they're the easiest to understand. So this is just a visual example of all of these um, in, in, terms of, in terms of order. Um, so you have linear Lagrange, you have, a, you have a, a, a quadratic Lagrange, the second order, third order, and then fourth order, or cubic Hermite, sorry. Um, so these, these all of these are what your needs are. Um, so if you have a, a wildly oscillatory problem, you might want to use a, a, a higher um, order basis function in order to be able to capture all of that. Okay. So in terms of uh, 2D, um, what is an example of a 2D Lagrange shape function? Um, so when we're, uh, again, when it's, when, if we're on a corner node on the other edges, and then if it's associated with the center, it's going to be one in the center and zero on the edges. Okay. So before I move on, does anybody have any questions about that section? Well, that's that's pretty pretty problem specific. Um, so if you run, so in practice, like if I were to start a, start a problem, um, and I ran it with a linear um, shape function, um, and I was getting either results that um, then I might try um, upping the order to see if, uh, if that, that's helpful. Um, and for certain applications, you, you, sometimes the higher the order, the better, sometimes not. Um, so it's just entirely dependent on, on the specific type of problem that you're, that you're trying to solve. So that was a good question. Thank you. Anything else? Well, yeah. I mean, so the default's, the default's first order. So for, for electromagnetics, say you're, you're using... Um, uh, sometimes you're using vector basis functions, and first order might not be enough, um, depending on what sorts of uh, uh, geometrical concerns you might have and that sort of thing. So the rule, my rule of thumb, my personal rule of thumb, David might have a, a, a different idea, but I generally tend to start low and then go high if I need to. Miracle integration. Um, now, the, uh, the, the, this is the only part that we haven't discretized yet, so we're splitting the, the domain integral into a sum of integrals over each element, so each cell in our mesh. So mo most of you probably, probably have an idea of what we're doing here. Um, so the, uh, we're, we're mapping um, our, uh, between the uh, physical domain to the reference, dom the reference element that we have. And so this Jacobian is, is important um, in Moose code as well as just in, in, in important in general. Um, so we're, uh, 
approximating these integrals numerically using quadrature. And so the quadrature is the, the, the XQ here is the spatial location of the Qth quadrature point and the, the weight that is associated with that quadrature and that's determined by your quadrature rule. Um, the, uh, the, that, that F of XQ um, part of that, that, that term. Um, so under certain situations, this is exact, right? Um, so if you're in one dimension, then the Gaussian quadrature can exactly integrate polynomials of order two n minus one with n quadrature um, might be might be important um, based on uh, your your what you want your your numerical in, in integration to be. So so then since we're sampling at our quadrature points, the u that we had earlier and is 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 our sum over u j v j at these quadrature points. Uh, equation we had earlier, but mapped um, with our Jacobian and our, and our quadrature rule. And so then this is our, this is our term over the faces of our cells. So Moose um, needs to provide the, the quadrature points for the, the, the whether, where your in interior of the cell are on the face as, as necessary, and it determines that. Okay. So um, some, some i, one through n, equaling zero, so we want to solve for those coefficients. And so we use it to solve on the nonlinear step, and we're finding the roots of this equation. So for a uh, scalar equation, f of x, so getting from, getting from uh, x, so we're updating by, by uh, going from our, uh, my, my mind just blanked. Sorry. Um, so, so anyway, I'm going to move on. Um, so, we, so we don't have one scalar equation here. That's the important thing to remember. We have quite a few. Um, so this leads to, to this form uh, where Jaco the Jacobian comes back in again. Um, the Jacobian matrix evaluated our current. It's important to note uh, that, oh, gosh, it's not my forte. Um, So after, after we, well, for Newton, for a simple problem, as our, simple, our, our, our sample problem is before, um, we have our residual. So the, the, com the ith component for the residual, our solution over each uh, individual coefficient and our, our, in, our, our uh, derivative um, of our gradient over each individual coefficient. Um, we can get the Jacobian for this. And um, for a simple equation, um, you might have a non-trivial Jacobian. So simple thing, you're, divide, you're, you're, you're taking the derivative of that, and so your Jacobian statement would simply be your, your coefficient times your, your uh, basis function. Um, but if you have a coupled term, um, then you're going to have to consider the Jacobian contribution for each individual coupled term. Um, so the, uh, the, like I said, they defend on the partial derivatives of all of these, which could be difficult or time consuming to compute analytically. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the method is, uh, uh, um, we don't need to calculate this Jacobian, though you can turn on um, full Newton um, and use the Jacobians that you calculated. Or you can precondition um, by um, using your Jacobian statements and developing a, a finite, finite differencing your residual statements in order to, to calculate a, a Jacobian um, internally to Moose, and that you can use that to solve your problem as well, or to, to precondition this. Uh, there is also an intense version of the Newton method. Yes. So there is a dampers um, uh, 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 class in Moose, um, and I'm not quite as familiar with that. Is David in the room? Uh, David? Do you know much about the dampers system, the Newton dampers in Moose? Uh, could you come up here and get a microphone just so it's so it comes through on the on the audio?
Is it ready? Have any? Um, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm not as familiar with the nuts and bolts of that. Can you step in, David? Turn on the microphone, by the way. I don't think it's on. No, I think it's turned it on. It must be above. There's a button on the side. I'm sorry. Sorry. There you go. Test? Oh, okay. So, um, the Newton solver is a line search, and so that might help you to get you to the root the way you want. But of course, like your initial guess is going to uh, is what ultimately decides, right? So when Casey was showing the steady state simulation first, and when he talked about the initial condition, that was actually your initial guess for your Newton solve. When we get to transient, your initial guess is going to be the solution from the previous time step. And that'll be used as an initial guess for your Newton solve. Okay. So the Jacobian free Newton Krylov method um, is the um, so so we have our, our system of AX equals B, um, where A is our Jacobian, um, X is our delta U N plus one from the Newton method, and B is our our, our, our negative residual. Um, and so, main fix. So, the linear residual um, is defined as uh, as a rho equals the Jacobian multiplied by um, the iterate minus our residual. And so, we are Moose prints this um, for every linear step, which is what you saw on the screen during step one. And so, if you set print linear residuals equals two, uh, a true, um, it'll show you that. Um, but that's on by default. Okay, and so I'm not as familiar with, with this portion, so I'm leaving this as a, as a reference, um, but the uh, Jacobian, the Jacobian free uh, method, um, or Jacobian free newton crowd method has a, has a lot of, <laughs> of different uh, settings, uh, different versions of it, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave that um, for, because um, uh, this is, this is, uh, um, Okay, so the, uh, the, uh, essentially what we're doing is we're approximating the Jacobian. Um, so saying the, uh, the, the residuals are, are, are multiplied by our, uh, let's see. Uh, so, so we're getting, for Moose, is, Moose is determining this, this uh, approximation, and but we don't have to do any, any analytic derivatives to, to d determine uh, uh, the Jacobian. Um, we don't, we just need to, the time we have to take is just for the residual computations. If you don't want to take up that much room in memory, um, then the Jacobian free Newton Kral method is, is, is uh, a good way to do it. Okay, so um, we're, to sum up, so we're, we're using the finite element method um, as a solution to our PDEs. So we're finding the coefficients for our basis function, and the solution is the combination of all of these coefficients. Um, in Moose, they um, compute integrals numerically using the quadrature, and then we're using Newton's method to do the nonlinear solve, and the, the Jacobian free Newton Krylov method allows us to Jacobian while still um, um, still um, computing the, the, the solution um, as if we had the Jacobian.